In today's episode, we go over some of the most horrifying bear attacks told on the channel so far. From a man who had his entire face peeled off and eaten by a bear, to a young man who was fatally mauled while feeding the huge 700-pound brown bear alone. These are some of the most horrifying bear attacks you'll ever hear. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. Welcome to Final Affliction. In Ohio, there was a man who was as controversial as someone could be. His name was Sam Mazzola, and he owned and exploited wild animals such as bears, tigers, and wolves. Throughout the years, Sam faced multiple allegations of animal cruelty and neglect. He was highly criticized by animal welfare organizations and activists. However, what really made headlines was one of his pet bears named Bart. Sam Mazzola was a well-known controversial figure born and raised in Ohio. From an early age, he showed a passion for collecting and caring for animals, which eventually turned into a hobby. As he grew older, Sam became more and more interested in the exotic and unusual, and he began collecting a variety of exotic and dangerous wild animals. Over time, Sam's collection grew to include a wide range of creatures, including lions, tigers, bears, and wolves. He became known throughout the community as an expert in the field of exotic animal care, and he was often sought out for advice and assistance by others in the industry. As his reputation grew, Sam began to exhibit his animals at fairs, festivals, and other public events. He would bring his exotic animals to these events, allowing people to get up close and personal with these majestic creatures. He believed that these exhibitions were an important part of educating people about the importance of wildlife conservation and the need to protect these animals from extinction. However, although he claimed he loved and treated the animals in his care well, there were a lot of controversies surrounding him. One of the most significant of these controversies involved allegations of animal mistreatment and neglect. Sam had been cited numerous times by the United States Department of Agriculture for violations of the Animal Welfare Act, including failure to provide adequate veterinary care, unsanitary conditions, and failure to provide animals with appropriate food, water, and shelter. In 2009, Sam's USDA license was revoked and he was fined $21,000 for violations. However, he was allowed to keep his animals. He also pled guilty in federal court to taking a black bear to Toledo without a license and selling a skunk without a license. Additionally, many of Sam's neighbors complained about his practice. The animal noises at night, the howling and barking were all disruptive to the community not to mention the danger that these wild animals pose to the neighborhood if they escape. Nevertheless, Sam continued his exhibits and would even let people pay him to wrestle a black bear. Unfortunately, the dangers and risks of keeping exotic wild animals would soon come to light in a tragic way. Ever since a young age, 24-year-old Brent Kandra loved the outdoors. He would spend long summer days exploring the creeks and rivers of northeastern Ohio, discovering new fishing spots. One of Brent's favorite pastimes was baiting bullfrogs with a blade of grass and catching large carp. For Brent, being involved with animals was more than just a hobby. It was a way of life and an opportunity to connect with nature. He would often spend weekends camping near the river surrounded by the tranquility of the great outdoors, and would always have a pet snake, a turtle, or a dog. Consequently, Brent's family helped cultivate this healthy love for animals. Unbeknownst to them, this would be the cause of his demise. When Brent entered his 20s, he began to tend to dogs and feed bears by working with Sam. Naturally, Brent's father wasn't all that enthusiastic about this idea, as Sam had problems with paying on time and keeping his word on the agreed payment terms. Additionally, Brent's father was worried about the risks involved in handling wild animals and feared for his son's safety. Still, Brent deemed this a better job than selling cell phones at the mall. Still, 
Brent would go against his father's advice and keep his job at the Mazzola property. Unfortunately, the fears of Brent's father would become a reality on August 19, 2010. It was Thursday evening, and Brent was preparing for the animal's routine feeding. The 24-year-old caretaker had developed a deep bond with Bart, the massive 500-pound black bear residing on Sam's property. As the sun began to set, Brent made his way to Bart's enclosure, carrying a bucket of raw meat that he had carefully prepared earlier in the day. The bear had grown accustomed to the sound of Brent's footsteps, and he stood up on his hind legs as soon as he heard him approaching. In his earlier days working with the animals, Brent was nervous around Bart. However, through time and in being around the animals so much, Brent believed he had gained their trust. Still, he knew that the key to working with wild animals was to show them respect, so he always approached Bart with a calm and steady demeanor. Slowly, he unlocked the door to the enclosure and let Bart out. Growing accustomed to Brent, this was a normal occurrence for Bart, being fed outside of his cage. Brent had been working on Sam's property for a long time, and he had developed a deep connection and confidence with the animals but he never expected that this love and fascination would turn deadly. Without warning, Bart suddenly lunged at Brent, grabbing him with its powerful arms and sharp claws. Brent tried to defend himself, but the onslaught of a 500-pound black bear was too much. Within seconds, Bart had taken Brent to the ground and began mauling him, biting him in the face, head, and arms. Brent could feel the intense pain and hear the roar of the bear as it viciously attacked him. He struggled to break free, but the bear's grip was too strong. Bart's sharp claws and teeth punctured through his skin and muscles, breaking the bones in his hand. Brent was no match for the powerful animal as it swiped at his chest, breaking his ribs. As the attack continued, Brent's mind raced with thoughts of survival. Bart's teeth punctured him all over his body, making him lose a lot of blood. Sam, who was also on the property, saw what was happening and began to intervene. He shouted at Bart, making noise and hoping the bear would be distracted or scared off. While Brent's screams echoed in the background, Sam scrambled for a solution. He picked up a fire extinguisher, pointed it at Bart, and forced the ferocious creature back into its cage. 911 services were immediately called, and Brent was taken to Metro Health Medical Center. Unfortunately, the next day, at approximately 1.30 a.m. on Friday, Brent succumbed to his injuries and passed away. The coroner said that the cause of death was sharp and blunt injuries to the body, consistent with a bear attack. According to Sam, during an interview, he was the only one to witness the incident. He declined to go into detail about the attack, but did mention that Brent was Bart's favorite caretaker. Sam also mentioned that it would be up to the family to euthanize the bear as he would respect their decision. However, he also mentioned that Brent would not have wanted the bear to die and that the bear loved Brent too. However, Brent's father and his ex-wife wanted the bear to die. Eventually, they went ahead with it and Bart was euthanized by a veterinarian. In a strange twist of events, Sam was found lifeless in his home in 2011. He was handcuffed, face down on his waterbed, and wore a leather mask that covered his face. The autopsy revealed that he died through asphyxiation with a bedroom toy lodged in his throat. Unfortunately, because he was left in the room alone, nobody could hear his cries for help. The circumstances surrounding his death is still a mystery. After Sam's death, the animals on his property were sent to various individuals and facilities across the United States. Sam's untimely death put the case of Brent's fatal attack to a closure. Although dangerous animals like tigers, bears, and wolves are beautiful animals, owning these kinds of animals can have fatal consequences. Despite the 500-pound black bear having a good relationship with Brent for years, he suddenly snapped, leading to Brent's terrifying final affliction. 
In August 2002, Rachel and Pincus Schwimmer took their three children for a holiday in the Catskill Mountains. They were from Brooklyn, New York, but always visited the Catskills for their vacation. It was something they did every year. They were staying in the village of Woodbridge in the Catskill Mountains. The heavily wooded, mountainous region is situated in the southeast of New York State. It is an area of outstanding natural beauty, a wilderness that stretches for 700 acres. The area is popular with hikers, cyclists, and water sports enthusiasts. In the winter, the Catskills also boast five downhill ski areas, which draw thousands of people to the slopes each year. Rachel and Pincus were staying with their three children in some summer cottages for the vacation. Those who lived in New York City often ventured to the Catskills to enjoy the fresh air and countryside that it offers. The area once attracted hundreds of thousands of visitors every year. Holiday cottages and hotels used to be popular and full to the brim with visitors, but now only a few holiday properties remain. Some of them were in need of refurbishment and looked run down. The young Schwimmer family had spent some time exploring the outdoors and were enjoying their time together. It was a glorious, sunny August day. After lunch, their youngest child, Esther, was due a nap. She was five months old. Rachel decided to place the baby in the stroller and head outside the cottage. She and the two older children walked around the site quietly while Esther drifted off to sleep in the stroller. Once she was sound asleep, Rachel parked up the buggy just outside the porch of their cottage. Next to it was a large grassy lawn, which she and the older children played on whilst the baby slept. The older children were four and two years old and happily ran around on the grass, chasing each other and squealing in delight. Unknown to Rachel, there was a bear nearby. It was a young male black bear, probably only two years old or so. He was one that had become accustomed to people and frequented the holiday cottages. He was on the prowl for scraps of food. He often rooted around in the trash, eating people's leftovers before heading back into the woods. The bear lifted his head his nose twitched as he sniffed the air. He walked purposefully towards the holiday cottages where Esther slept peacefully. Suddenly, there was a shout from one of the holiday makers. Rachel couldn't make sense of it at first. She stood up and looked around. Then the shout came again. Bear! Rachel saw a young male black bear come ambling out of the surrounding woodland. It headed straight for the grassy lawn and the family. Hurriedly, Rachel grabbed her four-year-old and two-year-old and ran to the cottage with them under her arms. She rushed inside and told them to stay there while she went back outside for the baby. But it was too late. She heard terrified screams and watched in horror as the black bear knocked Esther from her buggy. The screaming infant landed on the ground. Then, in one swift movement, the baby was lifted up in the bear's jaws. It shook her tiny body from side to side. The baby's screams were ear-piercing as she hung in the bear's mouth. Everyone came running out of their accommodations to see what all the commotion was. When they saw the dramatic and terrifying scene unfolding, they began running at the bear. They shouted and screamed at it to drop the baby. Reports suggest that Pincus, Esther's father, chased the bear. He was injured as the bear swiped at him but he kept running at the bear, trying desperately to reach his baby girl. In a panic, the young male black bear ran into the woods, less than 20 yards away, with Esther still in his mouth. Several people, including Pincus, pursued it. They picked up rocks and stones and hurled them at the bear. At first, the bear stood its ground as the rocks came crashing down on it, hitting it on its back and face. But then, amongst the chaos of the screaming and shouting, the bear panicked and dropped the infant. Then it turned and ran off into the woods. Fallsburg police officer Dave Decker arrived within minutes of the incident. When he pulled up, he noticed the baby's stroller knocked over in the middle of the grass. He followed the sound of shouts and screams into the nearby woodland. The infant lay on the ground, and Rachel ran up to her. She was bloodied, and her screams had died down. Rachel wrapped her in a blanket and an ambulance was called. Tragically, on the way to Ellenville Hospital, Esther died from severe neck and head injuries. It had happened in a matter of seconds. 
Everyone was shocked and stunned. Panic began to spread through the people. Backup police officers who arrived on the scene shortly after Esther had been ambulanced off found the bear. It hadn't moved very far from the site and had climbed up a tree. The officers took aim and fired five shots at the bear. It fell to the ground with a heavy thump. The bear was taken away for an autopsy and to find out whether it was suffering from anything that could have altered its behavior. Woodbridge Mayor James Slater said that bear attacks in the area are very rare, and Ward Stone, the state's chief pathologist, said that in his 34 years on the job, he had never come across anything like it. That's why he was determined to find out whether the bear had a disease. Usually, the black bears in that region were very shy and ran away from humans. The only trouble they caused was from eating bird seed put out by locals and dog food. Encounters with people were few and far between. Rabies was ruled out as were a number of other viruses. Inside the bear's stomach was woodland vegetation as well as human food, small plastic bags, fruit labels, and aluminum foil. The bear had clearly become accustomed to feasting on human food and was attracted to the area because of it. The bear hadn't been tagged, which happens if a bear has caused problems before. He was a young male weighing about 155 pounds, 70 kilograms. He likely hadn't long left his mother and was finding his feet in terms of foraging for food and securing territory. Wildlife experts tried examining the bear's brain to look for any abnormalities, but two of the officer's bullets struck the bear in the head, making that difficult. Experts say that he was probably attracted to the young family and, in particular, the baby due to its unusual smell. Milk and diapers may have enticed the curious bear, and some suggest that he may not have intended to kill the baby. Prior to this attack, the last known fatality involving a bear in New York State was in 1987. This was an unusual incident, though, in which a young boy climbed into the polar bear enclosure at Prospect Park Zoo in Brooklyn. He was fatally mauled by two polar bears there. At the time of the attack in 2002, the American Bear Association said that only 40 deaths in the whole of North America were due to black bears. Esther had been incredibly unlucky. Following Esther's death, there were calls for bear hunting to be introduced in neighboring states, New Jersey and Connecticut. At the time of the fatality, bear hunting was illegal in these two states, and as a result, numbers of bears have been rising rapidly. This has led to more bear-human encounters and frequent complaints about bears wandering into residential areas and even people's homes. Feeding bears, intentionally or unintentionally, can lead to a dangerous situation where the bear becomes habituated to human presence and loses its natural fear of people. When bears become used to being fed by humans, they may start to associate people with food and become more likely to approach humans in search of a meal. This behavior can pose a serious risk to human safety, as bears can become aggressive if they feel threatened or if they perceive humans as a source of food. Once a bear has learned to associate people with food, it may continue to seek out human food sources, even if they are not being intentionally fed. This can create a dangerous situation for both humans and bears, as bears that have become habituated to humans may be more likely to attack. Situations like what happened to Esther Schwimmer can be drastically reduced, and people can enjoy nature without meeting their final affliction. Covering nearly 600 acres of land, the Apshawa Preserve is one of the largest nature reserves in New Jersey and is under 50 miles from New York City. It's a popular escape for those hoping to leave the bustle of the city for a more relaxing atmosphere. The protection of the New Jersey Conservation Foundation has allowed the area to flourish with oak and maple trees, along with a great diversity of animal and bird species. One of the largest inhabitants of this reserve is the black bear, and their numbers are on the rise as their numbers creep towards 2,500 individuals. These bears are considerably smaller and less aggressive than their brown cousins, 
and are less likely to cause a conflict and will usually stay within their own territory. Unfortunately, as their habitat has slowly increased in popularity as a hiking destination, more and more people have entered their habitat with little to no awareness of the danger they are putting themselves in. Darsh Patel was a 22-year-old student who was studying technology and informatics at Rutgers University. On September 21, 2014, Darsh and four friends decided to go hiking on the Abshawa Preserve. They had all individually visited the preserve in the past and were avid nature enthusiasts, so they were all pretty confident in their own abilities. After packing their bags full of their essentials, they set off the next day using various park and trail maps. They began hiking at 8 a.m. that morning and traveled along the first loop of the trail, taking photos with their cell phones of their surroundings and any animals that they encountered along the way. They were able to capture some images of the deer that grazed in the nearby fields, safe in the knowledge that the deer fences would keep anything off of their paths. They were mistaken. There were some unprotected areas, and certain predators knew exactly how to take advantage of these weak spots. As the group was finishing the first loop, one of the boys suddenly shouted out that he could see a large black bear creeping the ledge in the distance. Excitedly, they all turned to the ledge that he was pointing at, but they couldn't see anything, as the bear had already run off. Someone suggested that they should go back to the ledge to try and get a closer look at the animal, but the others decided that it wouldn't be smart to risk getting close to a bear that they could no longer see. It could be anywhere, after all. Instead, they continued to hike further down the trail, keeping an eye out for another possible bear sighting and hoping that this time they'd be able to capture the animal within their camera lens. As the track became a little more unkept, the group were forced to enter the unfenced areas of the park. Excited about the potential of capturing a bear on camera up close, they entered the fields in the unfenced part of the park. They were taken aback by how stunning the sights were, marveling at the beauty of the Butler Reservoir and the rolling green landscape around them. After walking for seven hours, they decided to take a short break. They reassessed their plan and decided to continue to the connector loop, which was mostly unfenced. They climbed up a ledge to eat their snacks of granola bars while they rested for about half an hour before continuing their hike. Suddenly, Darsh spotted the black bear that his friend had seen earlier, only this time it was much closer and staring straight at him. Darsh froze and stared back at the 300-pound bear as it looked him up and down. Excitedly, he began to slowly raise his camera to capture the image of the animal only 100 yards away. Instead of being worried he'd be attacked, he was instead concerned about missing out on a photo. He was convinced that the animal would be scared of him, giving him the advantage. Darsh's friends spotted the bear as well, but they started to realize that the bear was slowly creeping towards them seemingly beginning its hunt. The boys became worried and wanted to leave, knowing that they wouldn't stand a chance, but Darsh remained in front of the bear, taking more and more pictures. His friends began to warn him that the bear was now stalking him, but he was too engrossed in his photography to notice or care. Suddenly, the bear began to pick up speed and quickly closed the 100-yard gap between itself and the boy, growling as it ran. All the boys ran away at the sight of this massive animal running at them, all except Darsh. He continued taking pictures, photographing the bear as it got closer and closer to him, and his friends screamed at him to leave and run with them. He was too engrossed in his photos to fully understand what was happening, until it was all too late. He finally realized that the bear was only 15 yards away and panicked. He turned on his heel and tried to run away at the last minute, but the bear was still behind him, running faster and faster. The boys separated and ran down different paths, hoping to confuse the bear so that it would stop pursuing them. It worked for a second, and the bear stopped in its tracks, wondering who to follow. But its eyes quickly caught sight of Darsh again, who was the farthest behind the group. Darsh had gained some significant distance from the bear while it stopped running, when suddenly, the worst happened. He tripped on a rock and twisted his ankle while looking over his shoulder at the bear. He screamed in fear as he watched the bear continue its charge at him. 
Knowing he had no chance of escape this time, the bear immediately closed the gap and pounced on Darsh, tearing into his body with his huge jaws. It bit down hard on his body, ripping skin and muscle from his face, torso, and arms. It grabbed him by the legs and began to drag him across the floor as blood began to saturate the dirt beneath him. The animal ferociously chewed into his body, leaving numerous cuts and bites all over him, trying to pull his limbs out of his body. He screamed in agony and called for his friends, but there was nothing they could do. They hadn't brought any bear spray, and playing dead was no longer an option, as he was soon to be dead anyways. He tried to push the bear off of him, but he stood no chance. The bear was too strong. Covered in dirt and his own blood, Darsh Patel died alone in the woods. The rest of the group were still running, scared out of their minds as they'd heard the anguished screams of their friend behind them. They were fairly certain that the bear had killed Darsh, but they didn't know if the bear would still continue after them once it was done. Once they had gotten far enough away and couldn't hear the crunching of an approaching bear, they phoned for the police to report Darsh as missing. 911, where's your emergency? Hey, hello, I'm, I'm on Mac Macopin Road. It's 81 Macopin Road. I believe I'm in West Milford or somewhere around there. We were hiking and we saw a bear and we all started running and it started chasing us. Two of us are okay, one other person answered, but two were really close and I'm scared out of my mind for them. I want to go back, but I'm, I'm hurt and I don't know what to do. You're hurt, you said? Like, not, not badly. I just scraped my leg. It's nothing, nothing major, but I'm more worried about them. Can anyone get here anytime really soon, please? Are you on a trail? Yeah, we were on the trail. Well, it's, it's going to uh, take them a while to get, to get anywhere near you if you're on a trail. A search party was quickly organized by West Milford Police to find the young man, and they combed the area for two hours straight. Finally, they found the brutalized remains of Darsh Patel's body. It was hardly recognizable and completely covered in blood, body parts strewn across the trail. As the search team were observing the mess of the body before them, they suddenly heard rustling behind them as the bear emerged from the bushes. It was coming to collect its meal once again. Startled by the number of people in front of its food, it began to get aggressive with the men present who were trying to shoo it away. The search team's shouts at the bear only further enraged the animal. Finally, for the safety of everyone and to avenge the young college student, they shot and killed the ferocious beast, ending its reign of terror. They collected Darsh's body and returned it to the family, leaving them to grieve for their son who had died too soon. It was declared that the group had done nothing wrong and that the attack was unprovoked, but they believed that the attack may have happened because the animal was extremely hungry. Smelling the boy's granola snacks on the ledge, it began to approach them to get the food from them, ultimately killing Darsh in the process. Running also would have activated the animal's natural predatory instincts, which triggered it to chase the group. Ultimately, it was an unfortunate accident that resulted in the death of a young man with a bright future. After analyzing the bear, shreds of Darsh's clothes as well as his skin and blood was found inside the bear's stomach. Darsh's phone was also found near his body with bite marks on it. When police looked inside his phone, they found his terrifying final photos before death. This was Darsh's final photograph he took before being fatally mauled. The bear is seen running towards him at less than 20 feet away. It was shortly after this moment when Darsh Patel realized the seriousness of the situation. It was at this moment he decided to run. Less than five minutes later, he met his horrifying final affliction. Karma is a crazy concept, but one that is widely believed to keep the natural balance. It is the idea that if you do good things, then good things will come to you likewise with doing bad things. We like to think that if we are good people, then we will be saved from negative energies around us, as it should only be reserved for those who intentionally commit bad behaviors. But what if this isn't the way the world works? What if every action is simply random and has no consequences on the outcome of a situation? 
These ramblings are probably close to what Wes Perkins was thinking in May of 2011, as a large grizzly bear ripped his face off in between his screams for help. Alaska's Seward Peninsula is on many people's bucket lists, with beautiful glacier hikes. The historic Iditarod, despite its appeal, visitors need to be constantly aware of their surroundings, as there are countless dangers in this icy wilderness. With most Arctic environments, the grizzly bear is able to thrive with its thick fur and expert hunting ability, which, in an area with an incredible diversity of fish and fauna, the grizzly bear is clearly the top predator. Despite this, these bears are particularly vulnerable in the spring as they are just emerging from hibernation. These animals will usually be in quite poor shape as they haven't eaten for months and might even have newborn young with them. They are weaker than usual and so are easier prey for humans. People have realized this and so there is an annual tradition of spring bear hunts. This is where Wes Perkins becomes involved. In May 2011, Wes and two hunting buddies, Dan and Edward Stang, arrived in Seward Peninsula ready to hunt some bears together. They were avid outdoorsmen and regularly organized trips together to escape from the noise of their towns. A few days into their trip, they found the tracks of a large male bear and began to follow them into the snow using their snowmobiles. They could tell from the paw prints that this animal was an incredible size and would be the talk of the town if they were able to hunt and kill it. Suddenly, the tracks disappeared. Wes got off of the vehicle and searched the ground for any sign of the bear. Little did he know, the bear was watching him from 70 feet away and was just waiting for the perfect moment to strike, the moment that the hunter would become the hunted. The bear suddenly pounced, launching himself through the trees and straight towards Wes. Hearing the rustle behind him, Wes turned and was horrified to see the huge male bear rushing towards him with murder in his eyes. He tried to grab for his rifle, for anything that he could use in defense, but the bear was too fast. Instead of the weak and vulnerable bears they were expecting, this animal was in the prime of his health and ravenous from a long hibernation, about hungry enough to eat a human if he could get his paws on one. He knocked west to the ground as his massive frame smashed into him at 50 kilometers per hour and, in one swift movement, grabbed onto Wes's face. His head was dwarfed in comparison to this massive predator, and as he stared at the rows of teeth in front of his eyes, he knew that his chance of survival was very low from this point onwards. Almost immediately, the bear began to shake Wes like a dog would with a new toy, using all of his skills to try and kill his prey. As he shook, his teeth sank deeper into Wes's face and he could hear his own skull cracking under the pressure that this animal was able to put him under. He bit more and more, harder and harder, trying to completely break his skull and end the whole ordeal. He forced his body into the ground and began to claw away at his body in an attempt to shred him into pieces. Wes felt that he didn't have long left. His pain was fading away and replaced with adrenaline that he knew he had no energy to even use. Pieces of skin and bone were being flung from his body as the animal viciously tried to kill him when his two friends finally arrived to the scene and saw the horrific scene. Not knowing if he was alive or not, they shot the bear quickly and from a safe distance. The bear let go of Wes while letting out a growl of pain before running into the safety of the forest. Once the men were sure that the bear had fled, they immediately attended to their friend, but they were horrified by what they saw. Wes's bone structure in his face was completely destroyed, with a terrifying array of bite marks and missing bone fragments strewn across his whole body. He was completely unrecognizable, and the majority of his face was hanging by loose strands of skin. He was missing his nose, his jaw had been ripped from his face, and, at this point, he was completely blind, clawing at his airways in an attempt to breathe. The father and son began to try and save his life, knowing that they would only have a short amount of time before Wes would become unresponsive, either from passing out from the pain or succumbing to his injuries. They questioned him to try and find out any information from the attack that may help him, but with no jaw, he was finding it impossible to respond to anything. 
he began to use hand signals instead, the only way that Wes would be able to communicate for a very long time after the attack. They radioed to Nome, the nearest town, informing the rangers of the situation and begging them for help. After hearing about the intensity of the attack and the condition of Wes, helicopters were dispatched in minutes, flying to the scene in an attempt to save Wes while they had the chance. While they were waiting, Wes drifted in and out of consciousness as the blood loss from the attack began to take effect. Once he was recovered into the rescue helicopter, he was immediately flown to Harborview Hospital, where he immediately was placed into a coma. He spent five days in this coma and underwent 26 life-saving surgeries, totaling over $1 million in medical bills. His face was completely reconstructed with titanium, replaced parts of his jaw where the bear had ripped it clean off, and he was unable to speak or eat independently for many months to come. He was unable to eat any solid food, so everything had to be fed to him from a blender, and his sight was barely salvageable, reduced to only light and dark. He was left with just half a tongue, something that the doctors were not able to rectify. And while he is now able to talk, it's heartbreaking for a man who loved to talk as much as he did, having to suffer these life-changing disabilities. Once he was finally released from hospital, many months later, he then struggled with a methadone addiction due to the high pain that his injuries caused. He was unable to live life without the help of this drug, dulling the pain for hours on end, just for it to return with the same brutality as the day the attack happened. Luckily, with the support of his friends, family, and medical professionals, Wes was able to recover once again. The recovery process was long, painstakingly long, and there were times when Wes believed it would be easier to just die and escape the pain and horror of his ordeal, but he lived on. Despite the ferocity of the bear, the remoteness of the scene and the horrific injuries that he sustained, Wes Perkins survived one of the worst bear attacks in history. Despite his ordeal, he says that he has no ill feelings towards bears, stating that they are neither good or bad, just wild animals, and people need to be careful around them. Wild animals will behave like wild animals. They are unpredictable and dangerous, but as long as you stay aware of your surroundings, then you should be able to survive. He is no longer able to hunt as he once did, but states that those who can should stay alert to stay alive and avoid the same fate as his own, having your face savagely bitten off by a bear and possibly meeting your final affliction. October 22, 2019, Alexei Ivanovsky was a soldier in the Russian army. He was taking a break from his duties when he and his friends headed out for the afternoon to collect crabs. Their destination was the shores of Kunshur Island off Russia's east coast. Deciduous trees mixed with spruce, pine, and fir forests, giving all-year cover at the foot of the volcanic mountains. The shorelines are rocky with jagged outcrops and steep cliffs. It is home to a number of rare bird species, as well as brown bears. Tourists make their way there by boat or plane. They take guided tours to see the four active volcanoes situated on the island and the fascinating geological formations. In October, the bears are getting ready to hibernate. They are eating huge quantities of food in an attempt to fatten up for the long, harsh winter months. They need to eat upwards of 90 pounds or 40 kilograms a day. Bears in October are hungry. For this reason, tourists are advised to take guided tours only. When Alexei and his friends headed down to the rocky shore, they split up to find crabs for their dinner, each with a bucket in hand. They scan the shoreline and the shallows for the edible specimens. Once Alexei got his eye in, he was catching multiple crabs to fill his bucket. But the group of friends weren't the only ones searching for food on Kunshur's shores. They were so busy eyeing crabs that they didn't spot a brown bear and her cubs emerge from the tree line. She had heard the friends chatting, she had smelt their presence, and she had homed in on their location. She was fast approaching them, stalking them silently. Alexei continued to crouch down, 
dipping his hand into the shallows. He hovered over each unsuspecting crab before rapidly thrusting his hand downwards and ripping it out of the water. Then, suddenly, one of his friends yelled out to them, Bear! Alexei looked up. Less than 50 yards away, a mother bear was walking towards him. Her eyes were fixed on his. Her head was tilted downward slightly. Her ears were pricked up. She lumbered across the rocky shore, each powerful paw spring-like as she came closer and closer to Alexei. Behind her were two cubs following closely. Although she looked thin, she stood four foot at the shoulder and she probably weighed in excess of 150 kilograms or 330 pounds. Alexei let go of his bucket and clattered to the ground. He stood up. Terror seized him. He held his breath, hoping that she would turn away, hoping that she would bluff. But this was not a defensive approach. This was predatory. The bear was looking for a meal, and she had found it. Alexei knew not to run. There was nowhere to run anyway. Behind him were the rock pools leading to the open ocean. In front of him, the hungriest predator on the island. Before anyone could do anything, the bear launched itself at Alexei from several yards away. It sprung at him, knocking him to the ground. He fell face down onto the rocks. He felt the incredible weight of the bear on top of him. He felt the searing pain as the bear slashed his body and punctured his skull. He gasped for air as he pushed his face into the ground. He tried to cover the back of his neck with his hands, but the bear's attack was so rapid and forceful that Alexei could barely think straight. With an agonizing rip, the bear grabbed his scalp in her jaws and savagely pulled. Something had to give. The bear pulled so hard that Alexei's skin peeled back over his head, exposing red, raw flesh. His friends screamed in horror and ran over to him. They picked up rocks and stones, flinging them at the bear. But with their shouts and screams, the bear seemed to become more and more frenzied in its attack. It shook its head viciously, thrashing Alexei's trembling body in its powerful jaws. The female bear momentarily let go of her prey, only to clamp around his legs and pull him away. Alexei was being dragged from the shore and towards the tree line. His friends followed. They continued to pelt the bear with all that they could find, but the bear didn't even flinch. With every attempt at rescuing their friend and scaring away the bear, the attack seemed to become more aggressive. The bear wanted to subdue its prey quickly. It wanted to eat its kill in peace, and the presence of the group of friends was making that difficult. She bit into Alexei's neck, and he let out an ear-piercing scream. She began once more to peel the skin back off Alexei's body, ripping and tearing it all the way down his neck and shoulders. Next, the bear grabbed Alexei's buttocks, tearing the flesh from bone. He was still alive. He was still fighting to stay alive. All he could do was persistently force himself face down into the ground. The bear kept trying to roll him over. She was trying to get his soft underbelly trying to expose his more vulnerable side. Alexei just kept breathing. He tensed every muscle in his body. The agony of the attack began taking over, and he felt he couldn't hold on anymore. But he was trying. He was desperately trying. It was agonizing for his friends, too. They stood only yards away from the bear, but felt helpless. Nothing they seemed to do deterred the bear. She was focused and determined. In desperation to save him, Alexei's friend, Alexander, rushed at the bear. He kicked it and tried to push it away. The bear briefly turned on him. In a moment of terror, it paused and looked up at Alexander, its dripping jowls gaping. It slashed Alexander with its huge claws and he fell backwards. But instead of launching a new attack, the bear turned back to continue devouring Alexei. Whilst the group quickly grabbed the injured Alexander and pulled him out of the way, another of the friends rushed over to their car. He jumped into the driver's seat and frantically turned the key. The engine roared into life and he slammed his foot down on the accelerator. He drove at the bear, revving the engine, flashing the headlights and honking the horn. He couldn't hit the bear with a car because she was straddling Alexei, but he continued trying to scare the bear. Again and again, he rammed the car forwards. At first, she didn't move. 
she continued to try and drag her prey away. Her cubs hesitated a few feet behind her. Then eventually, the three of them gave up and ran off into the trees. Alexei's friends ran over to him. He was in a mess. His exposed flesh was oozing blood. His boots had been ripped off. The bite in his buttocks was bleeding profusely. His friends applied pressure and talked to him. They willed him to stay awake, willing him to survive. They immediately called the emergency services and waited anxiously until, to their relief, they heard the distinctive sound of a helicopter. It landed a short distance away, and the medical team rushed over to the attack site. As they were loading his bloodied body up into the chopper, Alexei closed his eyes and his heart stopped beating. Immediately, the paramedics began CPR, and miraculously, Alexei's heart began beating again, but he remained unconscious. He didn't respond to his friend's cries or to the emergency crew. He was flown 250 miles to the regional capital, yuzhno sakhalinsk where surgeons immediately began patching him up. His ear was sewn back on. The gaping wounds and torn skin were stitched back together. He was pumped full of antibiotics to keep infection at bay, but they couldn't save his leg. It had been bitten so badly that the surgeons had to amputate it. Alexei was left in a coma. He received around-the-clock medical care and survived for more than a week. His friends were hoping and praying for his recovery, but sadly, his heart gave out and he passed away nine days after the attack. He was just 36 years old and left behind his wife and two children. Bear attacks are relatively common in Russia. There are approximately 120,000 bears in Russia, and reports suggest that over a 25-year period, there were more than 260 bear attacks. As humans encroach more and more on bear habitat, there are greater chances of bear encounters. Whether these are predatory or defensive attacks, the outcome is rarely a good one for the person involved, often resulting in their untimely final affliction.